Yeah, that's okay. That's good. No worries. Huh? Very good. I, I think it's the other power point. It was the other power point. Okay. Very good. Lovely. Um, well, thank you so much, uh, everyone, and uh, welcome, Abuna, Nathaniel, all the way from St. Mark in Atlanta to St. Mark in Toronto. So we're so happy to have you, Abuna, with us. Um, looking forward to learn from your evidence. Please, Abuna, bless us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Abuna. Thank you. <clears throat> this is the first St. Mark Church of North America, right, Abuna? Yes. Okay. Okay. So it's definitely a blessing to be with all of you. Um, thank you for showing me some Southern hospitality this week. Um, so um, we'll start this way. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit of God. Amen. I hear you guys have a unique healthcare system here, a little bit different than down south, but we all get the same stuff done for our physical health. You and I get the blood work done, we get the MRIs done, we get the CT scan done, we get all that stuff done in order to check our physical health. How many of you have gotten a result that you cannot understand and you end up just Googling, what does that mean? I have elevated whatever in my blood work and you look it up and you try to figure out what's wrong with you. Has it, have you guys ever done that? No, just me? Okay, well, okay. The doctor, so some, the doctor assesses them. The doctor is, but have you, do you guys ever like, get an email saying, oh, your, your results are in, and you, then you click on the portal and you open it up, and then? No, they have to go. They, to the, the, the doctor tells Ah, uh, I see. Okay, okay. They're okay. advanced. Okay, I see. Yeah, definitely different. Yeah, definitely different. They're advanced. Yeah. <laughs> we need someone to tell us. <laughs> so we do all this stuff. You pay very close attention to what your healthcare provider will say. As far as, hey, this elevated marker means you have this going on, or you need to be doing better at this, or you need to stop doing this, or you need to eat that because of this specific marker. So we do all these different things to gauge the health of our physical heart. My question that I, I want to spark our conversation this evening is what tests do we do to gauge the health of our spiritual heart? You and I see people all the time that you look at their life decisions, you look at how they conduct themselves, and you tell yourself, man, if, if I were them, I would never do that. I, if, if I were him, if I were her, I would never date that person. I would never take that job. I would never, I would never do X, Y, Z, right? Do you, it's so easy to see the, uh, yeah, sorry, there's yeah. So, it's so easy to see the flaws of other people compared to ourselves, right? We look at other people and we say, I cannot believe that person is doing that. But it's so hard I mean, I know it's kind of hard for us to admit it. It's so hard to see within ourselves, but it's so easy to look at someone else and realize, I cannot believe he did that. I cannot believe she's doing that. It's so easy to see it in other people, but very difficult for us to see it within ourselves. I want us to talk about our life regrets, not in the past, but moving forward and how we can minimize. Because something also we can all relate to of things that we have said or done that have hurt other people. Or let me flip it around. You have been hurt by someone saying something that's very hurtful. Even though they might come back, maybe some of them do, and say, hey, well, I didn't mean it that way. Or it didn't, I didn't mean it for it to come out that way. That's not what I meant. But the damage is done. Right? There is a scar within all of us from pain that someone did or said that has hurt, right? I mean, they hit below, it, it just hurt, it hurts. So we've all experienced that. But also the sad reality too is that we have most likely hurt someone else without us even realizing, oh, it was just a joke. I was just being lighthearted. I didn't mean much. I didn't know you were going to understand it that way. But we most likely have hurt someone else to the same degree that we have been hurt by someone else's words. You guys with me? So we've all been hurt 
by someone else's words, and most likely we have hurt other people as well. This is why around the year 1000 BC, one of the wisest people on planet Earth wrote a series of manuscripts, a series of books to try to articulate wisdom because this is was his number one prayer. What was, is it okay if I don't use the mic? No? Yeah. Is it, is it, is it okay now? What is the name of that, um, that person who desired wisdom more than anything else? Very good, King Solomon. King Solomon, he said these words right here. Above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Guard your heart because everything you do flows from naturally what is in your heart. So if there is any type of tension, sin, pain, weight that's upon your heart, it's only a matter of time until it comes out, it comes to the surface. So this is why King Solomon says above all else, manage, assess what is sitting inside your heart because it's only a matter of time until it comes out. I think this is a saying in Canada as well. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words, words will never hurt me. <laughs> Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. I don't know the origin of that, but I, I think we can all agree from life experience that's false. We have all been hurt by words. We have all been hurt by words. But what are words? I mean, they're just they're, the, the words that we say or the words that have, we have been heard by others is just the manifestation of what is in that person's heart. Someone's words is just a manifestation of what is already being settled within their hearts. So we do all these things to focus on external things of our lives, right? Of, of, of looking at our career, our physical health, how I look, how my perception is online, so forth and so on, to, to gauge like my health. But the hard, stressful thing is for us to gauge the health internally of the inner life. I, I feel that's, that's harder than to assess and just focus on the external things. Right, because we can fake it, right, and to, to other people, to our coworkers, to, to maybe those whom we date, you name it. We can we can fake it outside that I have my life all together. I can definitely fake it on social media that my life is perfect, right? And I, but the, the hard part is to assess what is settling within us. King Solomon said these words: that words have the power to be like a sword that's being thrusted into someone that can hurt, or words can be used for healing. You, you and I have also experienced how someone's words can bring, can, can ease the pain that we might be going through. We can experience that as far as the power of words. It can turn away wrath, right? You, you've seen someone that's just ready to fight, and then someone's able to say the words to kind of decompress the situation. Words can also stir up anger. These are not my words. These are the words of King Solomon as he's talking about the power of words. And, power, and words also have the power of life. And uh, so I think we all understand from life experience the power of words. I want to share with you this beautiful quote I came across, across recently from St. John Chris Austin. Stick with me. I know it's a long day, and, but just kind of stick with me as we break this down together. God has surrounded the tongue with a wall, with the barrier of the teeth. Okay, so he's, talk, he's just talking about physical, like his, his physical body for a second. God has surrounded the tongue with a wall, with the barrier of the teeth. The fence of the lips in order that it may not easily and heedlessly utter words it shouldn't speak. What is St. John, what is his meditation? St. John is saying, okay, I have my lips, I have my teeth that are, that are filters before words are being, before they come out. If this is true physically, do I have any barriers in my heart or what do you and I say? Well, I'm just speaking what's on my mind. I, 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 just, I just speak the truth. If they don't like it, they don't like it, right? This is, this is how we try to justify us saying whatever we want, regardless if it hurts other people or not. So if St. John is giving this meditation as he's just meditating on his own physical health, he says, okay, words come from here to here, but it goes first through my teeth and then through my lips before it comes out. Do I have any filters, any barriers before something comes out that's already settled within my heart? So for us, like before we say something which has the potential to 
Go back to, to King Solomon. That has the power for life and death, or to turn away wrath, or to stir up anger, or it's a sword that thrusts, or it can bring healing. Do we have any filters? Do we have any mechanism to assess if we strengthen this virtue, if we strengthen this muscle, it can minimize many of our life regrets. You already know this. Like Jesus made a big deal of focusing on the inner life because he wanted to transform our heart to bring healing, to bring redemption for us internally. Right. So this is why this what fueled many of Jesus's parables and analogies and the way he spoke is by looking at the inner life and trying to convict us of what's going on within us. So Jesus gave this analogy. Right. He's, he's going to speak in a very practical way and kind of go deeper. No good tree bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. Let me ask an unrelated question and tell me. Why is many of Jesus' parables, analogies, examples deal with plants and agriculture and seeds and all this? What, what, like, what would your guess? I mean, I'm just kind of picking your brain, but what, why do you think? Yeah. I think at a superficial level, it's like geography of Okay. Okay. Very good. I was gonna say it's just yeah the people where a lot of people were farmers so they can relate to messages when they can draw analogies to what they are used to. Yeah. 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 I'm with you. Okay. Anybody else want to add to that? Yeah. Very good. Very good. Absolutely. So spot on for, for all three of those responses. I just wanted to kind of share this because I feel like this shows so much of Jesus's like fatherhood and love that he's using analogies or examples that the people can relate to. His audience are farmers. They're in the field of agriculture. They understand this. So th th this is not like a far stretch for them to understand this very common uh, example. No good tree ba bears bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit, right? So they understood. So he's speaking their language. He understood. So this was a common way for Jesus to relate to them, to pull them in, for, and to use practical, tangible things to feed or to nourish the soul, right? So moving on, I just want to. Each tree is recognized by its own fruit. People do not pick figs from thorn bushes or grapes from briars. So he's continuing on with that analogy. He's like, if you have a fig tree, it's going to produce figs. You're gonna have a, a you, you're not gonna have grapes coming from a briar. So he's he's continuing on and speaking very practical. The audience probably gets this. There's nothing new. Just you and I understand this, even though none of us are farmers here. I don't think we we get this right. Moving on. A good man brings good things out of the good stored up in his heart, and an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. So now he's speaking of what is already stored within our hearts. So I know for all of us, we all have a bunch of stuff, heavy stuff from our, from our past, from our own current struggles, from different things that are just sitting within our heart. So we all ha have that. So Jesus is saying what is, what is already stored is naturally going to come and produce fruit, good or bad fruit. That's, that, that, that's a different topic. But whatever is being stored up, that's the thing he's, he's highlighting, is naturally going to come out. And the, the people get this. I understand. If I plant this type of seed, I know what to expect. If I plant that type of seed, I know what's going to expect. Yes, it's the time, it, but it's not, it, there, there's no, it's, it's not going to be like, it's not going to blow anyone a surprise of what's going to come when I plant this type of seed. So he's speaking at a very practical level. To put it in a one-liner, what comes out of you is an indicator of what is inside of you. What comes out of you is an indicator of what is inside of you.
let me give a couple, a few examples, just from a psychological level, but obviously this is connected to our spiritual state as well. When we say hurtful things to others, most of the time, I'm totally stereotyping. It's coming from anger or it's coming from sadness. When I'm saying hurtful things, it's coming from anger it, or it, it's coming from a sadness that comes out. I'm sure you've heard the saying, hurt people, hurt people. Another example of someone who is super critical, right? They're always critical. It doesn't matter what this person does. I'm always going to be critical of them. But if I'm always critical, and I'm always judging others. It's coming from most of the time an insecurity or, or a jealousy. If I'm always critical of what this person does or what they do and they can never get it right, most of the time it's coming from an insecurity, coming from a jealousy. All right? Let me share another conversation with Jesus had. When he, Jesus, had called the multitude to himself, he said to them, hear and understand. So I don't, I don't, I, I want to pause here because when Jesus pauses and says, hear and understand, or verily, verily, I say unto you, he's basically telling them, listen, I want you to pause what you're doing. Hear me out very carefully what I'm about to say. Jesus is basically elevating the seriousness of what Jesus, what he's about to say. He continues, hear and understand. Not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. So again, he's pushing the same principle in a different conversation. Then his disciples came and said, said to him, do you know what the Pharisees, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this saying? So the, the disciples are coming to Jesus saying, don't you know that what you're talking about is offending the, the Pharisees, they're not happy that the way you're talking, because you're, you're talking about like something that's about the inner life. You're, you're really rubbing them the wrong way. Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard the saying? But he, Jesus answered and said, every plant which my, fa my heavenly father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. Jesus is saying their heart is hardened. They, they're unable to be responsive to what I'm saying. Put them aside. Like I, I'm not here to deal with those who are not wanting to be transformed. They are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into a ditch. He's talking about the Pharisees. Then Peter answered and said to him, explain this parable to us. So Jesus said, are you also still without understanding? So Peter very, very vulnerably says, Jesus, I don't understand what you're saying. So Jesus, is, Jesus responds to Peter saying, what else do I need to say to make this super clear to you? So Jesus now continues because he, Jesus is wanting to drive this message to you and me. Because I promise you, if we do not assess what's in our heart, it will naturally explode. It will come out. It will impact those around you. It will impact our relationships. It will have a generational impact unless we deal now with what is settled within our hearts. So Jesus didn't just end the conversation says, you know, whatever, Peter, you just think about what I said earlier and, and, and deal with it. No, Jesus continued because this is driving a big message. Do you not yet understand that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart and they defile a man. For out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands, like what the Pharisees are also focused about, they, those, are, those are not the things that defile a man. The Pharisees, the, the legalistic Jewish rulers, they're just focused on a bunch of do's and don'ts. They think this is what is, makes a person righteous. This is what defiles a man. But Jesus is saying, I, I'm not focusing on the external rites and rituals of, of how to pursue God. I'm trying to focus on what's in the heart. Nobody wakes up and says, you know what? Today will be a great day to cheat. Today will be a great day to be a chronic liar. Today will be a great day to live a double life. No one wakes up and says that. But it begins with a seed that's planted within the heart and naturally grows from there. Not to uh, like pull on strings, but if you and I look within us at some of our biggest life regrets, there's a common theme for many of us. If we look at our biggest life regrets, 
we intentionally distance ourselves from other people. They don't get me. They're from a different culture. They don't understand what, if they were my shoes, they, 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 they don't understand what I'm going through. They don't understand how I feel, right? We intentionally distance ourselves. We justify our own action. We rewrite the narrative to justify what we want to do. Like these are common elements that exist in our biggest life regrets. This is why I wanna close out, I wanna share with you some words of wisdom, I promise you. If you and I take these words of King Solomon and we apply it to our lives, I promise you, it makes the biggest difference in every capacity of our lives. And I'm, I'm not exaggerating. So like, let's kind of digest this together the words of King Solomon about how to be wise. Where you, you and I want to be wise, but we kind of just keep it like, oh, wisdom is like, like you, we can't grasp it. But here, King Solomon is going to give us handles on how we can apply wisdom to our lives. The wisdom of the prudent is to give thought to their ways. I question to you, what does the word prudent mean? Or if you want to use context clues, you get it. The wisdom of the prudent is to give thought to their ways. <laughs> what is someone who's prudent? Careful. Careful, okay. Again. Consider it. Consider it. Very good. Yeah. Someone who's prudent understands that the decisions they make today impact tomorrow. A prudent person understands everything is connected. The opposite of, of, of a not prudent person or a foolish person, they think, YOLO, I only live once. This, you know, this is my chance and I'm going to do my own thing. This is my night. This is my day. This is my time. You, you so forth and so on. And they just live for the moment, right? We fall into that deceptive thought and we live for the moment. We take advantage of this. Not realizing the decisions you and I make today impact tomorrow. By the way, kudos to all of you on this cold night that you invested in getting back in your car after a long day of school or work, whatever, and still come to church, which I, I know, I get it. I know it's not easy. So kudos to you for making that investment. The wisdom of the prudent is to give thought to their ways. But the folly of fools, like the essence of what it means to be stupid, the words of, if, the, the, the words of King Solomon, <laughs> is deceptive. Is to be is to fall into deception. Fools mock at making amends for sin, but goodwill is found among the upright. Let's break this down. Fools mock at making amends for sin. Fools say, you know, what's the big deal? It's not like I'm doing this or doing that. It's what I'm doing is not the end of the world. I'm not hurting anybody by my doing this. Or this hasn't killed anybody before. So what's the big deal when you're doing? It's only one time. It's only three times. It's only like, it's, it's just it's just me. It doesn't involve anybody else. Fools mock and making amends for sin. But goodwill is found among the upright. Don't you want to be upright? Don't you want to be a person of integrity? There is a way that appears to be right. But in the end, it leads to death. And I want to intentionally speak about the deceptive thoughts that come to us from social media. There are deceptive thoughts. That post says, follow your truth. Do what makes you happy. This is your moment. This, you, you need to cancel him. You need to, you need to break this toxic whatever. Yeah, sometimes it's legit. But you know what happens when you and I see those, 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 those quotes? That, and especially when it looks cute and they got the flowers in the background and it seems attractive, it's like, like a nice quote, and it just pulls you in. You know what happens? You end up applying that quote to the thing you want to apply it to. And you know what that becomes? Confirmation bias. You want confirmation to do what you want to do. And you're going to like that post. And then all of a sudden, Instagram, TikTok, you name it, knows you better than you know yourself then all of a sudden everything that's on your feed is going to continue to confirm what you want to hear. It seems to be right. It seems to be right. And you begin to justify yourself of why you ghost him, why you ghost her, why you cancel him, why, why, why they're toxic, why you need to you know, remove them from your life and do what's best for you, right? You can take that. You can take this full quote unquote theology that I just said, and you can hijack it and apply it to fuel a high cancerous level of selfishness, a high cancerous level of individualism. 
but we don't want to call it that, right? That, 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 sounds, that, that sounds bad. That's unattractive. So we dress it up. You do you. You do what makes you happy. You, you, you don't need, you don't need to, to be under the oppression of you name it, right? The, the, this entire theology that is taking the post-Christian culture by storm, that, that's taking millennial and Gen Z cultures by storm, they, th this is what's fueling so many people. You and I know family and friends who have left the church because of this ideology, but we're not any different. It can creep into us very easily. It seems to be right but at the end, it leads to death. So please question and be careful of these things that seem to be right, justify what we want to believe, but it ends up leading to death. Even in laughter, the heart may ache and rejoicing may end in grief. You know what this reminds me of? Even in laughter, the heart may ache and rejoicing may end in grief. To me, I'm not, I'm not saying this in a spirit of being judgmental, but those who post pictures that their life is perfect, the perfect vacation, the perfect pose, the perfect whatever, and everything is perfect in their life. But grief and void is still settled within them. They, 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 they laugh publicly and small talk and joke and noise, but inside they're still empty. Even in laughter, the heart may ache and rejoicing may end in grief because we're focused on the external things. We're focused on the superficial things, but inside there's still an ache. There's still a wound. There's still unsettled things in our heart that's just sitting there. And it's just a matter of time until it comes to the surface, surface and explodes. The faithless will be fully repaid for their ways and the good rewarded for theirs. The simple believe anything they hear on that podcast, on that YouTube channel, what their boyfriend, girlfriend, coworker told them, classmate told them. The simple believe anything. The simple only surround themselves with people that confirm what they want to believe, which will eventually lead to life regret. The simple believe anything. But the prudent, one who's wise, wise, gives thought to their steps. The wise fear the Lord and shun evil, but a fool is hot-headed and yet feels secure. That last part, a fool is hot-headed, but feels secure. You know those people who just, they, they, they are engaged in a conversation with you. And let me tell you, today, my wife and I, we went to... Um, What's the place that looks like Times Square in Toronto? But it's not Times Square. Yeah, Red Okay, whatever. So we went there. What is it called again? Yeah, Red Okay, anyway. Or Nathan Yeah, it's that, but I don't know how to pronounce it. Where the Engating Arena is? Nathan Phillips Square, where the Toronto, that big Toronto sign? Close to there, yeah. Yeah. So we went there, and and there was there was somebody like passing out like free Korans. Young and Young Okay, yeah. So the part of me wanted to engage in the conversation. Uh, but Sarah told me don't because where was my mind? I was a fool because I wanted to be hot headed and I wanted to feel secure and I wanted to give it to him. But what am I want to say is, have you ever been in those conversations with people that that are just going there to say, let's talk about something, but they're so hot headed. They're not wanting to hear what the other person has to say. They're only coming in with their agenda point. That was totally going to be me today in the conversation, but I didn't. But you and I have dealt with people like that. Obviously, it's not you, it's not me, right? It's always the other person, right? They're always hot-headed, and they just, they're always giving their point. You're always wrong. They're always right. Even when you're talking, they're not really listening. They're just waiting to talk over you once you're done talking, once you take a breath, and they're going to keep it. They're so hot-headed, yet they feel they're secure. They feel they're right. Everyone else does not get me. Everyone else doesn't understand what we have or what we're going through, or they're from a different whatever. And we justify what we want. A fool is hot-headed but they feel that they're right and everyone else is wrong. I, I just want to leave you with one simple thing to digest, to put into prayer, especially in the spirit of looking at Jonah, the spirit of, of the Ninevites, mm -hmm. what fueled them to live a transformational life and to change is they focused on the inner life. 
Yes, they used the exercises of fasting to not just for the sake of fasting, it's to fuel a change inwardly. The same has to be true for you and me. And I promise you, I'm not, oh, I'm not just saying this in a cliche way. I'm not saying this in a, in a fluffy way. If you and I take this seriously, it can minimize our life regrets. It will produce more fruit in your relationships and other aspects of your life. And I promise you, it becomes a fruit that has a generational impact. You and I have been hurt by people who have not managed what is settled within their heart. You and I have the potential to either continue that trend or to stop it, but that's up to us. Do not wait until you and I are put under pressure and then that nasty thing comes out of you and you respond and you say that hurtful thing or you do that thing, which will later lead to regret. It will come out unless we figure out why it's settled within us and to come to our true physician and say, God, heal me, redeem me, restore me. Let's utilize what the church gives us as far as the sacramental life of the church. It, fasting, but again, I'm saying fasting not in an isolated way of just saying, oh, I'm going to pass on the ranch. I'm not saying it in, a, in just like it's whatever. But for us to, to, to discipline ourselves, this will lead to a heart to, for, to being transformed. But it's up to us. It's up to us. Heart work is hard work. Heart work is hard work. And my last thing, my last thing. The prayer life the church gives us. Try, try, try. Not, don't let it be a head thing, but let it be a heart thing. As far as the prayers of the church, as far as the, the liturgical life of the church, don't just enter Lent in a couple weeks here as if it's just like, a, you know, all right, Lent, oh, let me just delay it's still preparation week and I'll wait and let me finish the cheat. Don't, don't just don't, don't make it a legalistic thing. Don't make it just going through the motions. But allow it a time for God to renew your heart. Just to give you one example, every morning, the church cheers us on to pray these words from the Igbe. O oh God, who causes the light to burst forth, who lets his sun shine upon the righteous and the wicked, who created the light which illuminates the whole world. Listen to how beautiful our church is. Enlighten my mind, my heart, and even the way of how I process things, my understanding. Give me enlightenment. Because there might be darkness, there might be deception, that no matter what that person does, they're always going to be wrong. Because I've, I've, I have a misunderstanding, or I'm so quick to judge them because of my misunderstanding. Lord, enlighten me. Maybe, I, maybe that, they didn't mean it that way. Maybe because of, of, of an insecurity within me, I interpreted it that way. And it built a grudge or it built a bitterness within me. I mean, don't just, sometimes when we pray, let's give thanks to the benefit, and let the whole world land our minds, our hearts, and our standing. But, but, but pause and digest what the church gives us. The church is not just saying, Lord, bless me so I can have a great day today. No, Lord, enlighten my mind, my heart, my understanding. For me to see others in the same way you see them. This has a huge potential. Uh, again, I'm not saying it in just a, to change our life literally if we prioritize what is settling in our hearts. To him be all the glory forever and ever. Amen. Any questions? I'm just going to stop the recording. <clears throat> Thank you.